In the far distant future, Alexander the Time Traveler encounters a terrifying predatory species that live in tunnels beneath the Earth, the Morlocks. The darker side of the future world is the, the world of the Morlocks. They are a society like social insects, like ants or bees. There are hunter Morlocks and there are spy Morlocks, and then ultimately we find the sort of the mind behind all of this, which is the Uber Morlock. Come a little closer. I don't like them. In some ways, the Morlocks, and particularly their leader, the Uber Morlock, the character that is portrayed by Jeremy Irons, is the negative mirror image of, of the technology that Alexander, our time traveler, embraces. It's a perversion of every natural law. And what is time travel? But your pathetic attempt to control the world around you. He is the end result of technology gone to hell. I don't know, I wanted him to be a surprise. He was written originally as the arch fiend. The sort of the final, the one in which in every film, you know, as you're, you're going through and finally you get to the room and there's the guy. I can look inside your memories. He's a pretty brainy fellow and in fact has a, a very large brain which spreads halfway down his spine. Don't worry, you're safe. I control them. For me, it was a, it was a wonderful experience to create Yuga Morlock with, with all the other people who were part of that creation and to make the costume come alive. He's completely white and uh, that meant a lot of makeup, which took a long time and a lot of skill to apply. Five hours every morning, we, we got white contact lenses for the eyes, so they became white. So I got to know my makeup guys very well. Now go. Three, two, one, go. go. Ah! Creature effects for the Morlocks were created by the Academy Award winning Stan Winston Studios. I've, I've been a fan of, uh, of the time machine, uh, the original story, the book and the original movie since I was a little kid, so uh, the chance to be a part of bringing it uh, back to life on screen was something that was intriguing to me. Also, obviously, the director, uh, uh, Simon Wells. He's the, he's the great-grandson of H.G. Wells, so there's history uh, that goes along with the making of this film. One of the, Simon's biggest strengths that he brought to the movie was sort of his animation background. He had very strong ideas on what the Morlock should, maybe it's genetic, I don't know, if, uh, what the Morlock should look like. I, I did a lot of design sketches, which I then passed on to uh, Stan Winston's studio. He did a lot of extra sketches. The direction we took with the Morlocks was greatly influenced by Simon's own sketches. Uh, with the exception of the, the Uber Morlock, uh, the characters that we designed were basically two Morlock uh, species, uh, which one was the spies and the other were the hunters. After the design of the characters done, what we did was we took the performers who were going to be in the suits, had their bodies laser scanned. We then proceeded to actually build the characters. Uh, they have life casts taken of their bodies. Um, person will stand there and have plaster bandage applied to their body and their head uh, and then from that we'll pour plaster on the inside or fiberglass to make a positive body form of their body so we have a duplicate of their body in three dimensions from that we sculpt on it uh, we actually take clay and apply it to the body form and that becomes the character and then we uh, take it to the paint department where the uh, artists then paint it using a rubber cement based paint Smaller details are applied with brushes and uh, stuff like that. The challenge of, of bringing the Morlocks to life was to take a character that we haven't seen before, create a character that we haven't seen before, required then for us to use our technical uh, expertise as far as creating an animatronic face, a face with multiple uh, uh, expressions, brow movements, eye movements, uh, lip movement, the ability, jaw movement, to give as much animation to our, our, our faces as we possibly could. Uh, it took three puppeteers per head to operate it. In other words, you had a guy on eyes doing the blink uh, and up and down. You had another person on the brow operating the brow movement up and down. A third person operating the mouth, which was uh, the jaw and the lips.
Dan is nothing short of brilliant. His contribution to this movie has been invaluable, and uh, the best thing is just when you see on screen those Morlocks, um, they'll be as terrifying as they were 40 years ago. Those monsters are scary. I mean, when I saw them for the first time, I really just thought, I'm not going to have to act at all. I will be genuinely <laughs> so afraid of them. <laughs> Travel. It's possible, sir. Not in this world. In the new big screen version of the classic story by H.G. Wells' The Time Machine, Guy Pearce stars as Alexander Hartigan, a man whose desperate desire to change the past oh. sends him on an incredible journey into the future. The Time Machine is the catalyst for him to take a journey. He's able to go back to any time he wants. Spectacular or go ahead to any time he wants. The future is now. The visual centerpiece for the film is the time machine itself, one of the most elaborate movie props ever built. The first big hurdle was, was developing and designing the time machine because it, the, the movie's called the time machine. It's, it's the centerpiece of our movie. It's a main character of our movie, really. It's not an accident that it's called the time machine, you know, and since it is called the time machine, the challenge is just to create an amazing prop. It's got to be one of the reasons why all of us actually got on board to make this movie. When Simon and I talked about the, the time machine discussed what it's supposed to look like, what it basically boiled down to, we thought it, it has to be a spherical object or a spherical, a spherical field. The whole thing starts up and it unfolds like a flower of glass and brass and wood and starts spinning and the sphere comes into action and there you go forward in time or backward in time. I came up with the idea of the Fresnel lenses of lighthouses, which, you know, wonderful, um, sort of great solid glass constructions, but glitter in a, in a quite fabulous way when they move around. So we then built a model uh, that he rendered with the sort of the full refraction of the glass in and spun it around, and we realized that was what we had to do. Creating the time machine was a process that took over 1,000 architectural drawings and well over a year to complete. It was very involved. We had about 20 special effects people working on it for two and a half months. There's a tremendous amount of working parts in it. It's the difference engine's got three different motors on it to make it work. A little closer, Kurt. Bring it up a little closer. The machine weighs about 4,000 pounds. This is a once-in-a-lifetime sort of thing. You, you know, I'll never get a chance to build a, a prop like this again. Yeah. It was exciting to see this thing up and running the first time we saw it. It's wonderful, really. I mean, in, in many ways, as, as an actor, you're relying on your costume and your makeup and props that you use. And so when you have something like a time machine... Good. That looks fine. It really allows an, an insight into the character. And it just, I suppose, allows you to feel the incredible kind of ambition and the, the, the genius of this guy, you know? It's amazing. I mean, you do genuinely think it could take you forward back in time. It looks like it really works. I mean, it's just, it's so beautiful. There are a set of rotating blades that actually function and look really great on the time machine itself. But at a certain point in time travel, they begin, begin spinning at a rate that they can't actually practically spin at. So we take them over and create a, C a CG digital version of those blades, which we spin at a much higher rate. And then we also begin to do things like add light effects. We form a CG time sphere, which protects Alex as he travels through time. So that is a digital effect that is laid on top of the practical machine that was photographed. The filmmakers worked with Academy Award-winning Effects House Digital Domain to create groundbreaking visual effects sequences. The most interesting thing from a visual effects standpoint was really illustrating the journey of time travel. What happens to the world around Alexander when he's traveling in time. In the first time travel sequence where he travels from 1899 to the year 2030, and we see the environment around him that he's used to, his greenhouse, his laboratory that he lived and worked in, changed. Alex gets in his time machine and goes forward, and we show the cars change, go from olden cars in the teens to the 40s, and the cars basically progress. And here there's mannequins changing and 
just basically showing the progression of time as he's cruising around in his time machine. And then in, in the second time travel, where he travels from the year 2037 to the year 802701, we see time travel on a geographic scale. The fellows at, at Digital Domain have software that uh, they developed that can actually render whole environments uh, with sort of realistic atmosphere and make that dynamically change in time. For us, visually, the most exciting thing was illustrating this process that the character goes through. He starts in this world that he's familiar with and trying to burst out of, and then ends up in this world where he can barely understand what's going on, and he's got to try and make sense of it all. So we really try to do the same thing visually, start off with a very conservative but exciting look, and then really get into a world where the audience is just being bombarded with these images that are just too fantastic to imagine. I ultimately think that the concept of time travel is, is completely fascinating and will always be fascinating, particularly if it doesn't ever come true, you know, if it doesn't ever become possible. Who knows if it will become possible? This shot starts with a motion control camera move shot on set. As you can see there are lots of lights uh, in the set that we had to remove digitally, as well as uh, two-thirds of the greenhouse structure isn't there. You see here all the digital elements being layered in, the greenhouse, the potted plants, the vines, the snow, all of that created digitally. The real technical challenge was getting the, all the digital elements to line up with this photographic plate, which as the whole movie was, was shot anamorphic and the inherent distortions in anamorphic lenses make the lining up of digital elements that much more tricky. The other big challenge was creating the greenery that grows and dies and getting that to look realistic. Here we had two photographic elements Guy Pierce on green screen and then the garage set as separate elements. All of the contents of the garage are digital. The cars and the boxes and all of the light effects on the time machine all married together to create the finished shot. Here the big challenge was creating believable and realistic looking geological erosion. We had to develop a lot of special computer tools to achieve this and then the uh, the real artistry comes in at the end when all the various elements are put together and made to look photorealistic. Here we had to kill off some Morlocks by taking the stuntmen and matching their movement with our digital versions which then turn into skeletons in the presence of the time wave. There were actually three shots in this sequence. This is the middle of the three. They all started with a photographic element of Jeremy Irons against green screen and in each case we matched his movement in our digital version of him which was made up of many layers starting with the skeleton, musculature, skin, wardrobe, hair, and then through the progression of the three shots, he ages, shrinks, skin starts to erode, muscles erode, and eventually his entire skeleton disintegrates and falls apart. This shot was a lot of fun just because of the graphic nature of his demise. It's not every day you get to turn somebody into a skeleton. This shot, we only had 10 weeks from conception to completion for. It's purely CG. All of the buildings, everything you see in the city had to be built in three dimensions. All of the traffic, buildings getting constructed. We developed special lighting tools for this as well to hopefully take the CG curse off of things that often don't look quite right because they're purely digital. 
and a lot of the later elements that come into the shot were added strictly in the composite, a lot of the cloud layers. One of the biggest challenges of this shot was due to the huge scale change from one end of the shot to the other. Things that we would create would only be visible on screen for a short number of seconds. Hi. 